Yeah, there's a hey everyone, how's it going? This is uh, Brian from Line Run. I'm here with my good friend Pavan <laughs> and a couple of our friends here. We're just leaving uh, the Whole Foods in Chelsea. Uh, we're here today to talk about the role of content and innovation. And before we get to that, I want to tell you a little bit about Pavan. Uh, Pavan is a proclaimed connector in global fashion and technology. He leads an engaged community of thought leaders working at the intersection of brand and innovation. He has advised over 150 growth stage companies through his previous company, Open Source Fashion. Pavan is the president of Mouth Media Network, a community first media company focused on creating world class podcasts. So, podcasts, really big thing. Uh, Mouth Media is the leading podcast network focused on covering business strategy and innovation behind various lifestyle industries and their B2B content is top in the world. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Yeah. <laughs> and right now we're moving on a Bolt bus on 23rd Street in Manhattan. And if you don't know what a Bolt bus is, it's a premium inner city bus service servicing Northeast uh, California, Nevada, Pacific Northwest, and Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So next time you need to travel city to city, take Bolt Bus, boltbus.com, check it out. All right, so we got all we got all that stuff taken care of. Um, Want to go back to well, all the way back to when you started your your podcast with mm -hmm. uh, with your partners. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Um. First off, dude, this is a wild experience. We're literally <laughs> traveling around Manhattan uh, hosting this interview. So thank you for the opportunity and thanks for you guys for for coming out. This is a, this is a trip. Um, so to your to your question, I guess at, at the time when we first started our first podcast, it's called Fashion Is Your Business. Uh, we were running um, a a consulting or biz dev firm called Open Source Fashion. Um, it basically is a product of a lot of community work that I had done in the space. Uh, when I left finance in 2008 or 2007 and I wanted to start you know product brand in the fashion space so started educating people or finding people to educate other people so I could sit in on, on those conversations and connect with interesting folks in the space and um, I guess in turn over the last uh, I guess the f subsequent years um, open source fashion became an agency and then it turned into a biz dev and consulting firm so we started the first podcast as a product like more of a content strategy for that company and that was three and a half years ago um, without any other intention except for telling the stories of the people that are in our community as well as trying to kind of like network up for our clients at the time and um, we quickly I guess after like five six months we realized how um, powerful the podcast medium was um, so even though we weren't getting these gangbuster numbers or the audiences, uh, when we would go to conference or industry events, people knew us all of a sudden, right? And and for, for our work as podcasters or just kind of being the voice for that industry. And um, in turn, we just, I mean, it was hard to ignore all the energy that was coming from doing these interviews and creating that content. Um, so much so that after just kind of feeling the tremors of our friends and all that stuff, just uh, listening to more and more shows, we completely pivoted into a media company, which is what Mouth Media is today. Cool, and going also into that decision of podcasts, why voice over video when everyone's stressing video, video, video? Uh, three and a half years ago, I had no clue what a podcast was. Like literally, so a friend of mine started one in the fashion space called American Fashion Podcast, which is uh, sub like now on Mouth Media Network. Um, but so he had started that and just kind of encouraged me. He said, "Hey, you know, suggested that you should probably do one for fashion tech because your community is interesting and um, you know it's really early for podcasts. I think people will really enjoy it." And for me, my literally my my knee jerk response was, "What is that?" and um, so I didn't know how to produce it, what to do. I did know that we had great stories amongst the community that um, that was within open source fashion. Uh, so basically, my uh, one of my business partners, Rob, now um, met another gentleman, Mark Rako, who's also uh, my third business partner now, um, at a dinner randomly. So Mark, so Rob and I. Um, Rob presented the idea with Charles and said, "Hey, why don't we start a podcast?" And then subsequently, that that's it, like next week um, randomly met 
Mark, who happens to be at a dinner that happens to be a podcast producer. So I guess the stars just lined up, timing was right, and um, we decided on voice because we had the opportunity to produce it. I mean, I'm not a producer of content at all. So, I mean, at that point, well, when I say at all, no visual content. So we were doing um, kind of like a, a HuffPost style blog where we had like 40 or 50 educators inside of the fashion or e-commerce space that were lending their um, insights to like a central portal, but it was all written content. So. And when you were getting the people to uh, come on the podcast mm -hmm. and really engaging with them and also the companies they work for, uh, how were you able to build those relationships with the brands themselves so mm -hmm. that they now are promoting you or uh, partnering with you to do different things? How yeah. does it really help them? Well, first of all, everyone loves to tell their story, right? So um, here I am telling my story, right? So there, like, there, there's obviously an inherent value to um, having a nice piece of content out there that's focused on what you do and, and how you, you can provide. And um, so I think that we started off with our core, right? Who was in our community, who we were already close with, that we knew that we're doing very interesting things. And, um, you know, once we were able to prove or show that we had um, domain expertise and we were, we were capturing interesting stories, uh, people also wanted to tell their own interesting stories in a reputable way. So uh, from there, it was kind of easy. And, and again, like right now, especially like everyone loves a podcast, um, but we never got those questions of how, how large is your audience size? We never got that question when we first started because again, three and a half, four years back, um, this really was a very new medium. So if I invited somebody or when I had invited somebody to be on a podcast, that was probably the first time they were ever invited to be on a podcast. Um, in many times at least, especially in the fashion space for sure. So it was, um, it was a really good opportune moment. Um, and I wish I could say that that was completely intentional and we knew the timing was right, but we had no idea. And fast forwarding to now and mm -hmm. talking about what's going on today and the fact that brands really want to have to build these organic and natural and casual relationships with their audiences. How important now is having content strategy and implementing a content strategy and having the podcast or video as part of their content strategy for brands? And how, how have you been able to really uh, capitalize on the fact that people are really focusing on this stuff now. Yeah, so the first part of your question, content strategies, I mean, it's always been important, right? Um, so I think that the, the interesting, I guess the parallel to draw with podcasting is now is what WordPress kind of did to blogging and to content strategy in that sense, or like having companies really buy into the fact that they have to be thought leaders online. Um, so it's, and, and then it goes to Twitter and all this stuff. So Twitter really was the disruptor, right? When we started, or I started open source fashion. And a lot of our, our conversations then were about content strategy in the sense of, well, how do you communicate on this medium versus um, Facebook, but it was really Twitter. Um, and how do you um, communicate through your blog and things like that and the widgets that you use to, to accept comments. At the end of the day, it's where you know, attention shifts is where people are going to prioritize. So, um, podcast has had this renaissance uh, happen, I guess, over the last few years, uh, most notably because of the show Serial. And since then, there has been a huge surge in independent podcasters um, starting to kind of um, identify or, or firm up their voice. And this has been going on again for years. We've been doing it on for three, four years now. Um, and podcasting as a whole north of 10. But now that the shift has been happening in a dramatic way over the last couple of years specifically, um, brands are now having to pay attention, having to invest in that. So it does now present a very interesting opportunity um, because I, I do feel strongly that every brand is going, if they're not, they're all thinking about it, and I feel that most of them will have some sort of audio participation over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so there's there's a lot of, it, again, it's 
it's a lot of uh, wait how do you build a website you know oh I'll pay XYZ dollars in, in like ridiculous amounts of dollars to, to build my website in 2002 but now it's easy right so I think that it's a, the early stages and people that know how to develop interesting audio content and that can also evoke a good story which is the most important again content being king um, it, it's it's a fun place to, to kind of ramble around in. And the fact that you have a, a podcast producer such as yourself uh, and, and Mouth Media and, and your partners uh, serve as like that third party verification that they can provide that, that extra oomph uh, and that expertise to really showcase and, and spotlight a brand, that, that's really important? Well, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of the the kind of how we've participated with brands, how it's evolved since um, starting. So with Fashion Is Your Business, um, we're all B2B um, content. And uh, in B2B content, you don't get, again, the largest audience in, in number size. You know, we're not talking about entertainment here. So, uh, but the folks that are in our audience space are high value for uh, a lot of software companies or, you know, whatever it may be. So what we've identified, well, we had an opportunity, this is in, I would say, 2015, I want to say. There's a conference in the e-commerce space called Shop Talk, and Shop Talk came out in, like, it was uh, an evolution of a company, uh, a conference called Money 2020, uh, which the same founders there had started Shop Talk, which was a huge investment on their part, and they had all the right speakers, um, beautiful experience that was kind of um, set up and they gave us an opportunity to come there and podcast live there but there was no travel budget there was no way for us to like they're not incentivizing except for the opportunity except for you have a space if you want to record um, now we identified that as a huge content grab opportunity but how at this point are we going to afford to bring four or five people out there um, I think it was at the Aria um, hotel um, you're talking about five people the hotel was pretty much sold out immediately and we're, we wanted to be there. So uh, we came up with this, this kind of idea that, well, look, everyone that's going to these conferences are, are interested in connecting with the speakers, right? So you have this huge exhibit hall of companies that are looking to connect with the folks that are on stage primarily or predominantly. Um, but the folks that you're looking to connect with, the larger retailers or whoever it is, they either walk around with no name tag or their name tags turned around. So it's hard to have a meaningful interaction that doesn't feel salesy and chintzy. So um, what we did was we went to a few companies that we had um, known that were going to be there exhibiting and we said, look, for XYZ dollars, we'll, you can take one of our host spots and host the show with us while we're there in Vegas and we're working with the organizers to um, reach their you know their sponsor and speaker community to have on board so we ended up basically selling the opportunity to broker these or catalyze these relationships through the podcast um, that ended up being really successful for us for uh, it still is actually for a few years and we started doing branding content in that sense so this is our form of native content I guess is is selling the guest host spot on our shows. Um, so that is currently a strategy that we deploy on all 14 or 15 of our shows now. And, um, and we cover innovation events on that side. Uh, but more recently, to, to kind of go with what we talked about in the last question is that now we're getting a lot of interest for companies, um, not only for external communication um, strategy, but for internal communication strategy. And they're thinking of us because they've either been interviewed by us or, or they know a friend who's been interviewed by us. So now we're getting a lot of inquiries about original podcast production. Um, and that, to, to listen to, to kind of be in those meetings and those conversations is really interesting to see how uh, brands are thinking about it. So uh, a company we're talking to right now is looking for a way that um, they could increase um, communication between departments and the company has say a hundred thousand plus employees so the days of um, putting updates on you know your company intranet are over right nobody is like reading that stuff so it's easier though to communicate if you had a firewalled um, podcast where the company can you know based on email access can now listen to the updates across um, 
I think, oh, oh man, what is the company that just released? Oh man, I'm gonna have to look this up in a break. Um, but there, there's a company that just this week released that they're doing in, um, you know, a podcast for internal uh, communication, but they also have it open to the public. So basically explaining why they are um, making the decisions they're making, uh, but allowing the public to hear those kind of thoughts and reflections. So what you're saying is the companies themselves now want to produce their own podcasts for their own employees yeah. to grow their processes and also their culture. Yep. 100%. So you're seeing that along with the, that forward bound thinking content strategy as well. How do you connect with your customer, which has been everyone's Achilles heel forever and it will continue to be, right? So how do you organically uh, connect in a meaningful way with your client, right? With your community. So um, yeah, using podcasts in both ways, which is really, really interesting. Definitely amazing. And honestly, it's the first time I'm hearing of it of companies using podcasts to, to communicate with their own employees, which actually, if you think about it, is a no-brainer, but yep. really other people wouldn't even imagine that. So going off of that tangent, if you were to come up, if you were to just pick one company that you'd say in terms of like a, a more broader sense in content mm -hmm. that's really leading the way or someone that we should point to as, you know, we should follow them uh, for content and uh, I guess podcast in, in a way but just general content who would that be uh so right now um i mean because she's top of mind it would probably be bobby brown um so she has a namesake makeup company that she has uh sold about a year back mm -hmm. and recently launched uh three different businesses one in the hospitality space which is a boutique hotel in montclair new jersey she has a um a beauty uh product line that she's launching um as a consumable brand, I believe, and uh, and then she's also launching a content, or has launched a um, a content platform for health and wellness. So the way that she kind of combines all three is very very unique. Um, what I like, uh, what she does with like kind of the branded elements with her hotel, just kind of doing those multi brand experiences that you see a lot in retail or pop-up now so having Casper mattresses and having espresso machines but putting that as a part of the experience is really interesting um, I like how Sh Shopify is doing a podcast um, talking about the um, the stories of different Shopify owners of stores and and you know giving them a platform on strategy like how how they've done certain things effectively I think that's very powerful um, especially driving right back to the brand of Shopify and what their core is um, and then if, if I was going to talk straight like podcast media companies uh, you know it would it would have to be the you know the Gimlet and you know the VaynerMedia and um, uh, there, there's just there, there's a ton of incredible incredible pineapple media is unbelievable um, there's just a amazing people in this space that are developed really unique stuff. You mentioned quite a few names there, yeah, like Spotify and what Bobby Brown's doing. Uh, Shopify. Uh, Shopify. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were to come up with three or four, even five, uh, different things that okay. you'd say would be like best practices, okay, based off of what they do, what would that be? Like for a brand, it's, are we talking podcasts? Yeah. Okay. So uh, okay. So you uh, consistency is everything. Okay. Uh, let's just say that the content's great, right? Like just the baseline content has to be great, and that's across every like medium ever. <laughs> so so let's say content's great. Um, consistency is really key. So um, building up that kind of expectation. Um, for your audience that, okay, so for Fashion Is Your Business, it launches or releases an episode 10.30 in the morning on Tuesdays. We try our damn best never to break that. We've never we've never actually missed a week of that show in over well over 250 or so um, recordings. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. It's, it's one is if you miss a couple weeks or I think it's three weeks, Apple automatically stops auto-downloading 
um, your file into the R your RSS feed into the app. Yeah. Um, so that's a huge drop off. You have to build that back up. But I think that the biggest thing is that now that there there's over four hundred thousand podcasts out there, and there's going to be an influx of way more than that to come. And uh, if you miss, there's there's only a finite amount of time, right? So a power user of a podcast can listen to about seven, I think, hours or so, which is a, a lot. An average audio listener is four hours per week. So a power user is at seven. If you take away, if they're listening to one, one of them is your slot and you take it away or you don't provide that, then they may look to fill it with another one and there's no saying that they're going to come back, right? So if you have someone's attention, it's so hard to grab someone's attention um, and it's really powerful. So if you can, um, it's to, to hold on to it is important. So, okay, so um, for that reason, consistency. Yep. I, I strongly feel that um, like you have to respect people's ears. <laughs> so, and what that means is I, even though you have, um, you could fall by the wayside with great content if um, your the quality is, is is subpar. And and I don't mean that it um, it has to be done in a professional recording studio. Sometimes actually that um, that detracts from the experience. Um, but I mean that it, it shouldn't be in an echo chamber, and it can't sound like you're, you know, like my parents talking to India in, in 2000 or like 95, you know, where they're screaming through like the, the phone. And it's just, you, you have to be respectful of, of people, people's ears and their experience. It's really intimate to be, so if I have head, you know, earplugs in my ear and there's a spike in, the, you know in one of the levels that's a jarring like to a point where sometimes I've like I've cringed I've taken my thing out like the earbuds out and I'm, I'm done like I'm just not going to revisit that so I think just giving attention to quality is important um, you know it's not an expensive hobby to pick up it's a time consuming one <laughs> but um, but make sure that you're you're respecting that. So that's two, three. I think developing community around the podcast is super super important, whether it's digital community um, or in person. So what we've done to the core of um, Mouth Media is always being community first, and what that means is we do live recording experiences for all of our shows, um, and then also uh, we started a dinner series for our past guests. So last night, for instance, we had. Um, a 16 person seated dinner um, at a beautiful new restaurant for past guests of our real estate podcast. Um, and that's to, again, just further encourage people to think about us, to invest in us, to, to, to help share, to help refer their friends to be on the show. It's kind of all of the above. And then we also do live recordings of all of our shows. So next week, we're, um, we're hosting a live recording of the current Innovators podcast, which will feature the VP of Design at Walmart talking about um, the new rollout of their new website, which is a big deal when it's on the macro scale of, of Walmart. Um, and, and so on and so forth. We're, we're doing them almost weekly. So I think that community is a huge, huge um, part of what we do. And I think that, again, like you could develop an audience in podcasting, and who knows if this medium is going to be where you thrive. But if the community is engaged. It doesn't matter about the numbers because you could take them with you. They follow they'll, you because the, you establish a relationship. Exactly, and they, they'll support you, right? So I think that audience, the, the there's a fine balance between the audience and community, and if you could take the audience and make it into a true community, um, it's you'll be able, yeah, again, it's it's transferable and it's powerful. So. Awesome. So we talked about ad advice and tips and best practices. Let's talk about mistakes. Mm. And if you were to talk to a content producer okay. and someone who, who's starting a podcast or starting a video or anything involving content, mm -hmm. what mistakes would you recommend they try? What things would you try to steer them away from so they don't make the same mistakes as you? Well, first of all, this is the first time I'm really appreciating the bustling in Manhattan. Um, this is like, yo, there is, there is literally nobody in front of us, and um, and, and to our left, uh, which is out of frame of, of the camera, is is just like blocked. So that I'm I'm marvel. This is fantastic. Um, 
Okay, so mistakes not to not to make. Um, I mean, the, the consistency one is a big one. We we had a, a huge drop off in one of our anchor shows uh, because we didn't publish for four or five weeks. I think that is honestly the the biggest one. If um if we had gone back um if if going back now again on the production side we didn't make a lot of early mistakes. We, I I came into it with a professional audio producer that was familiar with producing podcasts for six or seven years at that point so we got very fortunate in that side so we're we're more on the you know on the um the thought leadership side of that conversation which is nice um but i would say that the consistency thing is something that we did not um see um another one is if i had so right now um podcasting is famously known for uh not um providing producers or this ecosystem is famously known for not having any data on, on the audience. So uh, we we realized that early, but not super early. And I think that if I were to, you know, when we're starting podcasts now, uh, we're doing everything in our power to identify who the audience is. So whether that's connecting your, your newsletter, uh, your, your LinkedIn groups, your Facebook groups, your, like any, any touch point you have to, um, to bring your audience into, uh, that, that you can then identify who they are and then understand what they're interested in. And the getting feedback is so important, like everywhere else. Um, I think that we would have done that way, way sooner. So right now we, again, a lot of the reasons why we're doing live events is to identify who the audience is. Um, we have a LinkedIn group, which is, um, administered. So we have to approve people to get in. Um, just so we know that it's not bots, but then it also gives us that kind of once a week we go through and um, and database who it is, right? Who, who these folks are, and and based on that, we're not giving personal information out or anything like that, um, but we are then able to go to a brand partner and say, well, we've profiled 10 or 15 percent of our full audience. This is how we've done it. Um, so 64 percent are female. Uh, they make approximately this much money um, you know the things that are foundational foundationally required to incite any sort of budget from a major brand or advertiser so that is a huge dysfunction in podcasting so if you can again um, figure that piece out early that that would be one of the mistakes that I think that we would have gone back and, and try to pay way more attention to early great stuff so we're arriving at our destination right now <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, thank you so much for you know speaking with us and being with us here today uh, on Line Run, uh, live as we're traveling to the urban space, 570 Lexington Avenue. Uh, for those of you who want to check out more of uh, Pavin's uh, podcast and all the great stuff that Mouth Media is doing, uh, check out mouthmedianetwork.com. Did I get that right? Yeah, you sure did. Mouthmedianetwork.com. And for those of you watching the video, we have another event coming up in June, June 13th, the power of community for brands and startups. You might want to check that out, June 13th with Sumit Shah, uh, linerun.co, not .com, .co. And next time you need to travel, check out Boltbus, boltbus.com. Thanks, guys. Cheers.